It's where the magic happens, let's be honest. Uh, it's a pretty well lived in shop. Uh, it's not a trophy shop, it's a working shop. Um, it's got everything from scraps I use to the machines, to all my hand tools. You know, really anything I need to build a wide variety of things. Because as you know, I've, I've gone through quite a few eras in my woodworking life. Everything from rustic furniture to more fine furniture and more recently art, you know, art serving boards and functional home decor. So, you know, a lot of this um, has lived through a lot of different eras in my woodworking life. And I, I love this shop. Some people think it's messy. I love it. Hey guys, it's Will with Creations by Will, and today I am just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, visiting with Paul from Copper Pig Fine Woodworking. How did you get started with Copper Pig Fine Woodworking? Well, uh, I started woodworking um, thanks to a neighbor of mine. He was an 80-year-old uh, neighbor across the street. His name was Hal. He lived in that brown house right over there. And when I first bought my house, um, we became fast friends. I like to say he was an 80 year old with a heart of a 20 year old. You know, after I got to know him, uh, we went down into his basement one day. He goes, oh, you like woodworking? Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't really into it, but I saw a bunch of handmade furniture around his house. And he took me down into the basement, which was a full woodworking shop. And this was 80 years of accumulation. That's awesome. And you, you walked through these little like corridor. It, it was like being There's, at Hogwarts, you know, in like- Massive piles of- Yeah, I mean, you, you, you had to sort of slink through these little walkways. And all around were tools and wood everywhere and just tools over many eras. N none of it was modern. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is the neatest thing ever. I was absolutely fascinated. And he goes, do you want to make something? And I said, are you kidding? Of course I want to make something. And then <laughs> That's awesome. uh, I would come home from work and uh, one day Hal had drawn out a stool just on graph paper okay. with a pencil. And he goes, we're going to make this. And I said, oh, great. He goes, he'll teach you all the fundamentals about what the different machines do and, and about some of the joinery options. And that, that sort of started it. And then so we were friends for about two years before I lost him due to the eventual heart failure. And then I continued on, you know, using a lot of his tools that he, he gave to me. Him and his wife were generous to give me a lot of his woodworking tools. And then over time, uh, I went into the next phase, which was the Internet video woodworking thing and at the time really Mark Spagnolo was really mm -hmm. back in 2007 2008 as I recall was really like the, the probably the best resource that I found and so a lot of it was you know learning through watching videos and just a lot of trial and error all machine woodworking okay and then I realized yeah. I was sort of hitting a plateau I felt like like I, it was hard to get information you could trust off the internet is like a blessing and a curse, right? Because it's like information overload, but yet there's all these adamant hobbyists saying that their way is the right way, it's the, right the way, only way. they invented this or that. Exactly, and, or yeah. this, you need this tool, you need this jig. Mm -hmm. And so I, I found myself like paralyzed with all the options of what I was getting. And being a scientist, I wanted to thoroughly investigate all of it before I made a decision on what to buy or, or how to go about something. But I realized the paralysis was doing more harm than good because I would spend four hours reading on the internet mm -hmm. and I got nothing done. Nothing out of it. Nothing out of it other than mm -hmm. a big headache. So I, I had to eventually put the kibosh on that. And I said, you know, there's these wonderful furniture schools in Boston. Mm -hmm. Right, there's the North Bennett Street School. As you know, the first trade school in America yeah, around right. since the 1800s. And also Phil Lowe's school up in the north, the north end of Beverly. Okay. Uh, the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts. I mean, these are world-renowned furniture schools. So you decided to take some classes? Yes. Nice. And they offered nighttime classes and weekend classes. And I thought, I'd be a fool not to try taking some of these. Especially with them right in your backyard. Yeah, like yeah. how many people have like a world-class, two mm -hmm. world-class furniture schools within 30 to 45 minutes not driving many, distance, right? Yeah. So I started taking continuing education classes. And that introduced me to the hand tool world. And that really changed the game, not only because of the accuracy you can achieve with hand tools, mm -hmm. but it showed me where the real bar was, like what professionals, like what their work looks like. Compared to? Compared to the, I think, more like the hobbyist. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, we you know, you, you sort of, as a hobbyist, you know, you think this is where the bar is. And you're like, oh, I'm doing pretty good. And then you see what the professionals do. And it's up That's here. It's just totally. Oh, it's a different yeah, class entirely, absolutely. right? Studio furniture and these like, you know, uh, period furniture makers. It's a totally, totally different standard of excellence. And it seems like <laughs> it's so simple, but in reality, like when you get into, into it and into the way of making it, 
the traditional yeah. method, yeah. It's, it's totally, oh, totally a right. whole different game. It is. So I knew that's where I had to go if I wanted to really push my skills. So obviously I jumped into the hand tool game, you know, full full bore, and I love it. And I'm not a purist. I love mm -hmm. the machines get me in the ballpark really fast, and then I, you know, you, you knock you everything take home it down from there. with yeah. the hand tools. And then, then after that, I met um, a, a friend of mine who was a graduate of the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts, Freddie Roman. Mm -hmm. He's a, a, a student uh, of Phil's from that school, and he's a full-time furniture maker here in Massachusetts. And Freddie and I became fast friends. Um, I met him one day buying a tool from him. And uh, you know, I said, if you, if you ever need help in the shop, let me know. Awesome. And funny enough, he actually took me up on it, which is rare. How it many is. people would just take like someone on sort of as a quasi apprentice now, now before that you have a long history as a scientist yes i am a lifelong scientist mm -hmm. I, i'm a biologist by training specifically the immune system and now i do uh, a lot of cancer work uh doing mathematical modeling of biology that's sort okay. of my thing now but i've always had a thing for building you know mm -hmm. i was a lego nut and i think you'll probably find a lot of woodworkers have that same passion Absolutely. for legos I because had, like every lego you could exactly yeah. i did too and, and it just logs. yeah it's like you never get tired of building and building i think like woodworking is just legos for adults as totally. far as i'm concerned totally. so this is just a adult manifestation of my lego addiction from being a child Fre freddie and i like because i think of our we formed a friendship and we're woodworking together and I think my skills, you know, were good enough that I wasn't costing him more time than I was saving. Yeah. I think we broke even for a while. And then eventually I started, yeah, I started to understand how his business worked. A lot of furniture restoration mostly. Okay. And, um, you know, working with him really showed me what the fabric of local professionals is like. Mm -hmm. uh, and also period furniture makers. And so through him, I met a lot. I mean, the whole world opened up in terms of like networking and and knowing people and he's the one who convinced me to get on Instagram and Instagram then has totally changed my life I was sort of getting into furniture and then fine furniture like period furniture two three hundred year old William and Mary style um, and then uh, about eight to twelve months ago I sort of hit a wall where I said you know I get it I get how to make it I've been doing ex I've been practicing my execution for ten years now I think it's time to stop copying what others have done and figure out what I want to make in my own design. There, there's a lot of inspiration in here from others though mm -hmm. that I've seen before and I sort of borrow bits and pieces of things I like from other people's work and sort of merge it into my own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, coming to that point about why so many woodworkers were like we copy sort of the work of others, mm -hmm. I think that's sort of a necessity when you're starting out because Definitely. the execution of woodwork is so difficult and so overwhelming that the design aspect on top of that it almost makes it intractable to okay. think, how am I actually going to pull this off? If I have to design it, get the proportions right, understand the joinery, and then execute it, like as you're, you know, as just as you're a learning woodworker, it's completely overwhelming. I mean, even the execution is overwhelming. So I think, in, in essence, copying design is sort of a necessity. I feel like design, you know, compared to execution, I think design is like Mount Everest. Okay. Because what do we know about design? How to do a mortise and tenon? Mm -hmm. We un we understand the process the basic, of a dovetail. Basic skills that... Like how do you do a dovetail, right? You set the right angle. You you yep. know you make marks. You cut. How do you design? So how did Instagram change your life? Uh, really, two two things. Actually, three things. Number one is it put me in touch with a lot of very very talented woodworkers, mm -hmm. and we talk all the time. I am chatting with my friends on Instagram daily. And it's everything from what do you like, what don't you like, to them challenging you to sort of think outside your box, mm -hmm. you know, or, or they, um, you know, challenge you to, to reinvent yourself, or why do you do things this way? Not not technically, but like, sort of, why do you choose to make the things you choose to make? You know, and so there's a lot to think about with my friends. You know, we we talk all the time about design and where we're going with our work. Number two, is it's allowed me an outlet to sell my work. You know, um, it's amazing. Yeah, I'll, I'll Did you ever think that you would be making <sighs> these things and not, selling them? Not really. <laughs> you know, I made because I enjoy the process of making. Yeah, yeah. And then, but you know, I have a really amazing customer base mm -hmm. who really enjoy the work I make. So I feel super fortunate uh, that people buy, you know, my work. And I, 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 I really appreciate it. 
And the third thing is a source of inspiration. So it's, it's sort of like you see elements you like in these posts. You know, I don't like to copy anything verbatim. Yeah. But I'll see an element I like and I'll mm -hmm. say, oh, that's pretty. And I'll see if like that seed of inspiration we'll can sort of grow else. into something else of mine. So uh, I save a lot of posts and when I'm feeling kind of flat, I just look through these images that have inspired me along the way and I just sort of scroll through these saved. That flame. Yeah, and you see if like maybe something will catch your eye that day because it, it caught your, your eye the day you saved it. Mm -hmm. And that then provides sort of can sort of fan the flame when you're feeling a little flat in your own head. Yeah. You know? I don't subscribe to that many woodworkers mm -hmm. because I find the best inspiration doesn't come from woodworking. What does it come from? It comes from artists in other fields. Because like woodworkers, we all sort of pigeonhole ourselves into making the same kinds of things. Absolutely. Because it's what we've seen. And I think it gets stuck in our head. And if I want to break out from that traditional woodworking kind of stuff, I need to unlearn a lot of what I've learned and stop looking at it all the time. So my feed actually contains a ton of textile, paper artists, ceramic, ceramics, a big time yeah. ceramic artists, mm -hmm. glass blowers, stained glass makers, metal workers, uh, painters. Most of, most of my feed is non-woodworking now. I'm looking for, for ideas outside our own field mm -hmm. to really, really push me outside my comfort zone. I, I believe there's huge opportunity for us as mm -hmm. artists at the intersection of fields. And I, 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 I do that in my science too. Like I, in science, I live at the intersection of biology and mathematics. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, there's hardly anyone at the intersection. And it means there's, there's not a lot of rules and there's, there's very little to go by. So you're sort of always pioneering, but there's a lot of opportunity. And I think the same is true in woodworking. So I think the pure disciplines, you're just woodworking, just metalworking, just glass blowing, they're great, mm -hmm. but they are in some ways saturated. Very saturated. Whereas if we can take two of these fields and mix them, I think these intersections are much less trodden places mm -hmm. and much less inhabited and there's huge opportunity there. And they, get, and they get a lot of traction immediately because it's so different as well. That's my, that's my observation. That's the other thing about Instagram is it allows me to be able to collaborate. And the reception I've gotten from other ceramic artists and artists outside of woodworking has been so warm and welcoming. But like I have, I think, five ceramic collaborators now. That's and really all cool. of them were like, let's do this. That sounds so fun. You know, That's let's really see what cool. we can come up mm -hmm. with. And so it's, it's, and they're, they're excellent artists, you know. I just feel so fortunate. So where do you see yourself going from here? I'll probably continue to do, you know, to make the kinds of things uh, I do. And um, eventually, when I retire from science, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do this through for the rest of my life. I don't, I don't see myself stopping this. Creatively, where I go, it's hard to say because even in the last eight months, things have changed so much. So hard to hard to look. And it's hard to keep the the motivation up too. It is, also, but especially um, when you're working a full time job. Sure, science sure, field, yeah. I'm out here at night, I'm yeah. out here on the weekends. But for now, you know, the motivation uh, fire is lit, and mm -hmm. I almost can't not be out here because I enjoy it so much. That's awesome. Getting all the skills and tools in place. Yeah, I always felt like I don't want to be limited by my own skill set. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make one thing because I don't know how to make other things. So what I've been trying to do is like dabble in each major part of woodworking so that at least I know what it's about and I have a basic competency mm -hmm. so that what, whatever I want to make, I'm not limited because, oh, you want to do some carving, take it some carving yeah. classes. Oh, you want to turn, you know, turn a leg or turn a bolt, no problem. I've turned before, I spent time at the lathe, no problem. You want to do metal work. Okay, I've worked with metal. You know, oh, what about elements of chair making? You know, with all the compound angles, no problem. You know, I took a class with David Duyard. Uh, to make a Windsor chair. Nice. So, uh, you know, I've tried to largely fill in each of the, the toolkits mm -hmm. from marquetry to inlay, carving. You know. All the skill set toolkits, you mean? Cor yeah. Correct. I mean, it, they, yeah, the tools are important the tools too, don't get me wrong, yeah. but um, tools are tools. I don't, I'm not a tool worshiper. Mm -hmm. You know, they work for me, I don't work for them. Absolutely. So, and then that goes back into, you use a lot of hand tools in here. I do. And a lot of these shops that are all machine-based yep. with all the jigs and everything, yep. 
that's more so creating you into working for the machine, right? Well, the jigs are helpful because they help with reproducibility and precision. And if I was making many mm -hmm. of, of one thing, I would definitely use the jigs and the machines. And I do. The machines get me in the ballpark. But the hand tools, because I do everything one at a time, the hand tools are like the finesse, allow me to do whatever I want to do. Um, you know, after the machines get me in the ballpark and save me a lot of time. So I, I, I use both, you know, sort of equally. But to me, you can't really, you know, only using one or only using the other is really difficult. I find that the, the intersection of both is, is where it's at. You gotta have those skills in, in, in both aspects, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, because the machines are so time-saving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they if we do. didn't use machines, we'd be sawing and planing a Forever. lot. Forever. Yeah. Forever. And it's, it's kind of... Um, like how did the woodworkers back in the day I know. get by? Huge respect. Well, they, they division of labor, right? They yeah. had a they had a team you know, of the guys. Yeah, they, doing and the each person work. just did that one thing. Whereas we're actually expecting ourselves to do every job. Mm -hmm. You have to be the turner. You have to be the the, the carver, the the marquetry person, the joiner, the they finisher, do it all. right? They do it all. So yeah, so in some ways we're actually expecting more of ourselves than they did back then because they they had one specialization so we're more like the master of the shop mm -hmm. who should have had a basic mastery and of should everything. be distributing that labor down that's right that's right the apprentices. yeah so in a way we're actually really expecting a lot of ourselves but that's good it is good yeah yeah we should hold ourselves to a high standard where did the name copper pig come from so this was my wife's idea we have uh, a copper pig weather vane on top of my shop Awesome. And we bought it at the. I saw that walking up. Yeah, the, yeah. We brought it at the at the Brimfield Antique Fair, and I made a cupola for it. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of thinking about a name, and I I had no idea what to. And my wife said, "Why do you call it Copper Pig?" I thought, "Oh, that's kind of." I mean, pig. All right, pig in the title is a little odd. A little weird. Yeah. But I don't know, copper maybe uh, sophisticated a little bit. Copper so. pig, and then fine woodworking. Yeah, and, and it I, goes back into. The metal and wood. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It does, it does, it does. So I, I, I wanted. I named it Fine Woodworking originally because mm -hmm. I wanted to, sort of, because I was trending towards period furniture, like sort of fine woodworking. Okay. Here's a sampling of sort of what I have going on at the moment in the shop, and I thought I would just share with you, kind of what's been going on. So, uh, you know, over the last several months, I've had an interest in plaid, as you can tell. Uh, I enjoy everything plaid, and I thought, you know, why not make a plaid cutting board? This actually was uh, inspired by the work of my friend Nick at Chopped Woodshop. He had uh, made a plaid cutting board. Not the same plaid, but again, inspiration that you sort of feed into your own ideas. Uh, plaid cutting board and I thought oh, that's so cool. I'm gonna make one and so I started making you know a plaid cutting board here And I have some blood wood some black walnut cherry and ash in this particular one And then I thought you know, let's push the envelope and let's go for a more complicated plaid Which then became this one. I only made this once because it's too much work um, uh, Yeah, so like um, you know a second plaid and I yeah, you know, I I started thinking maybe I could use these in, in other kind of design elements instead of cutting boards. So most recently, uh, I built this block of plaid that I'll be using as like drawer sides on tee boxes. And I thought, how cool would that be? You pull a, you pull a, a tee box open and you see plaid drawer sides. So uh, plaid is a big uh, inspiration for me, as you can tell. Um, then I work with a lot of ceramic artists and this uh, is my most recent serving board. Uh, which has these ceramic medallions made by my friend Sherelle Paul at Mud and Yarn. And she made these for me and sort of challenged me to come up with a cool way to cast these in a wooden item. And I thought, how about a serving board? And I would connect these medallions through with a brass rod. In fact, they spin, which is kind of cool. Uh, it has a little bit of a steampunk look to it. That wasn't intentional, that just sort of came out of it, and this beautiful piece of black walnut. Some of the negative space I like, the use of ceramic, metal, and wood, you know, sort of marrying the ideas. Uh, also, you know, sushi boards like this, uh, this one, which, uh, it's a little rough, I have to do the final coat of shellac, I just sanded it. But you can see it pairs like highly figured woods with some live edge ideas, with a flower, um, these were laser cut by my friends at Ventana Surfboards, and then I inlaid a DNA strand out of brass, which uh, is remarkable on this board because it's for a friend of mine who's a fellow biologist, so it's sort of an inside joke between us, the DNA strand. 
So as I mentioned, I enjoy working with other artists and other medium, and these tiles here represent sort of a few selections from some of the other people, uh, other ceramic artists I work with. And I wanted to give you an idea, like the artist will give me like, it could be as simple as a organic shape like this, in this case, dripping with gold with a beautiful glaze on it. Uh, it can be a nature inspired shape like these by my collaborator, uh, Christy at California Soul Shine, uh, or these more ornamental shapes by my collaborator, Kentia. Uh, at terraforma pottery and you know i'll get these shapes and then i have to sort of come up with you know what could that pair with made out of wood and look original and sometimes it's really hard i struggle and i i think i think for days and days about what i want to make and just to give you an example you know how do i come up with something cool out of these organic shapes and uh, I struggled on this one, and then I eventually came into this idea, as you can see here, which is a, a piece of highly figured maple where there was a branch and it has compression strain. So you see this really cool figuring radiating out, almost like from an epicenter, which is where the branch was. And I thought, why don't I inlay these like this? And so I, I made recesses for these two pieces as if like they're like the center of some kind of seismic event and you have the you know, the, 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 the sort of, I don't know, uh, stress radiating out from that. And then I have these lines here, which will be gold stringing. So I'll put some brass stringing that comes and then curves around each. And then this will be sort of elevated as a sushi board. And I thought, well, that looks pretty cool. I've never seen anything like that. Um, hope the customers feel the same way. So this represents my sort of, uh, idea bin and I keep or my box of tricks where I keep a lot of pieces of wood around that I just sort of look at day in and day out as I'm sort of searching for inspiration. So for example, this whole box is like ebony offcuts that I got from a collaborator of mine, uh, Ventana Surfboards, and they get it from Santa Cruz Guitar Company, uh, along with a whole bunch of laser cut fish scales that, it, you know, I, I've used in a lot of different designs. This box represents sort of my flower days when I was making these uh, decorative flowers out of various woods. Like this is a hot, what we call hot tub redwood. It actually came out of a hot tub in California. Okay. Um, I keep fragments of old Yosegi stars I've built and you know, just shapes. Like for example, I'm not sure what I want to do with this, but I made it one day and it didn't work for the intended purpose. So I just keep it in my box of tricks and someday that'll get used. Um, more flowers, you know, all kinds of interesting things, burls and pieces of black wood. Then in this box, I keep some of my patterns. My friend Brian Alcorn uh, at Alcorn Woodshop made this really cool harle Harlequin pattern out of veneer, blue and white veneer. Very talented uh, period woodworker. And he just did this as a test to see if he could make it. And I'd say, oh, it came out so great. And I said, what are you gonna do with it? And he goes, nothing. And I said, give it to me, I'll, I'll, I'll find something to do with it. So I leave it in my box of tricks. He also made this, this nice cherry and maple sort of banding. And I'm thinking about sort of reversing it to make a, maybe a checkerboard pattern. Another good opportunity for drawer sides. And then I have uh, my skateboard collaborator, Alex Wong at Upcycled Skate Art who makes these beautiful rainbow veneers out of recycled skateboards. That's really cool. Yeah, he saved uh, these, to get these particular colors, he saved, you know, set them aside for a couple years. This represents about 14 skateboards uh, crammed together. If you wanna see how it looks in the raw, you can see the skateboard ends here, each of the skateboards. But I feel like this really, you know, helps push the creativity envelope, you know, opening up a whole bunch of design possibilities. And last but not least, this box here, which is like my Yosegi star box when I was into, you know, for a while making these stars and using these as patterns in a lot of my woodwork. So I just keep them all here. You know, all the basic shapes are here. Uh, some red, some, some uh, brown, all kinds of unit um, patterns here that I pull from for inspiration. So where can people find you? Uh, probably best place is on Instagram at Copper Pig Fine Woodworking or at my website, uh, CopperPigWoodworking.com. 
Cool. And I will leave those links down in the description to his website and social media so you can give him a follow and check out the things that Paul makes. Thanks so much, Will. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Um, Thanks for watching this video, and please subscribe and share this video with everyone else if you like it. Yeah, this cool. guy's great. Nah, this guy is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. So a lot of people ask me, yo, Paul, when are you gonna quit your job and follow your real passion? And I'm like, hell no, I am doing my real passion, which is both. It's both science and woodworking. And by being a scientist during the day, not only does that scratch the you know sort of intellectual itch that I have about uh, you know, being a scientist, like it's a, it's a lifelong uh, lifestyle. It's not really, you know, just a a job. I don't consider it a, a quote unquote job. It's a lifestyle. You know, science is everything I've done since college. You know, eleven years post college education, and then you know, and so it's not really about following that passion. I am. You know, I love being a scientist, but at the same time, I love making stuff uh, at night out of wood. And so having three to four hours every night and on the weekends to do this is just absolutely enough time. It's a great balance. So yeah, so my daughter likes to get in the shop uh, occasionally. She's not a, she's not a huge uh, wood, wood shop nerd or anything, but um, what gets her in the shop is the dollar signs associated with it. She likes to make things and they sell at reasonable prices online, like her last serving board. Um, she sold for a hundred bucks and for a 10 year old, that's a lot of cash. She likes to refer to herself as the copper piglet. Um, very cute. Um, so uh, she took on a few extra commissions after her first sale. She's, they're due by December, $100 each. So that's sort of how she earns her cash outside of uh, allowance. That's what he's doing here. Is he like, so what's up? He's like, oh my God, you're uh, like yep. famous. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so famous. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm like a celebrity. <laughs> Daddy, you're like a celebrity now. Oh my gosh. Oh you my guys god. Should, you guys yeah. should pay to hang out with me. Paparazzi. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have your autograph? <laughs> Paparazzi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stop. <laughs> so, Ruby, you like woodworking? Uh, Not no. Really. No? No, not at all. But do you do it? Yeah, I do it to make money, though. And how do you do that? Um, I made so. So you boards. don't enjoy woodworking, but you no. do it so that you can make money from it. Because it's the fastest way to make a lot of money. How so? So, it, every time that I make a board, I can sell it for way more money than just doing like a lemonade stand. Why? Because people like it a lot more when I sell it off of Daddy's Instagram. That works. <laughs> yeah. Use all of his materials, all of his followers, and I get money. Hey, wait, I have a question. What percentage do you pay me? I give you love and affection. Yeah, okay. That's another way to say zero. How do you design your pieces? Um, over like two months, and wherever we go, like if we suddenly have an idea about what we could be selling, we'll write it down on like an app on a phone and then save it for when we start. So for example, I have a commission, so I've been thinking about what kind of board I wanna make for, um, like I've been designing on the, I mostly design on um, your phone, Dad. Yep. But I'll take time like thinking and then when I finally start making I'll go back to the um, uh, pictures and I will like pick out the board color and what kind of wood I want to use. I'll get all the materials out and then I'll start like on the first step and then it takes a long time. It's like, Daddy, how long would you say it would take for like one board? I'd say we put... I don't know, anywhere from probably seven to ten hours on each serving board we make of yours. Probably yeah, seven to ten lot hours. Of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. People don't understand. I don't think, I feel like the only part I really don't like is using the scroll saw and then doing the revealed grain and like sanding it. It's like, yeah, it's ugh. But that's like your signature, right? Doing yeah, that's what I have to do to make the board like, like unique. 
What is the original inspiration behind your designs? Well, first we looked on Instagram to get like inspiration. And then after we found something, we asked the um, inspiration if we could use the idea so that we're not just like copying the idea fully. Yeah. Yeah. And then at first I was making hearts, um, revealed grain hearts with, um, I would scroll saw like a little heart shaped wood to go make like a square piece. I sold those for a while, but then um, I decided to start selling boards for more money so it didn't take like so the hearts took a little bit longer because there was like so many you had mm. to make to make a lot of mm. money. So cost benefit so, analysis. Yeah. We did a little cost benefit analysis and we decided we wanted to change our product up. Yeah, because like Perfect. everybody that would get it has already got it. So it's like not, Oh, so you saturated not the Not a lot of other people That's another are another good point. Want yeah, it. supply and demand. We saturated the marketplace. I want to give a shout out to Matt Keddy at Keddy Workshop, who was kind enough to sort of share the revealed grain and give us some pointers when we were just starting out. He's uh, always been super helpful and very generous with his uh, knowledge. You have to have a lot of followers to sell stuff. Yeah, well, you did that for me, so it's like... That's the business side, Will, like you were talking about. That's the business side. Right? Like, how do you get eyeballs on what you want to sell? That's the hard part. So Ruby, if you didn't have your dad's Instagram, how would you sell your woodworking? I say wouldn't do woodworking if I didn't have my dad's Instagram or his <laughs> shop or anything. I would that wouldn't even be like. So basically, you'd be penniless, is yeah. what you're saying. Oh, I see. Well, so I'd make like lemonade stands. Okay, so you'd basically be penniless. Is yeah. that what you're saying, right? Or I'd like start chores, but like. Bleh. So. <laughs> so if your dad deleted his Instagram account today and you wanted to continue making money woodworking, what would you do? That's a good question. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I don't even know what I would do. I'd just quit and then like live off of the money I have. Uh, that so would what happens out. when you run out? Uh, then hmm. I would maybe do a couple chores. Couple chores? You should be doing chores anyway, girlfriend. No, I don't want to. Um, <laughs> a cleaning lady at mom's house so our houses clean a lot yeah and it doesn't I, mean you shouldn't do chores and we cleaned my room so like cha ching I did a chore well you want to help me figure out how to make her do chores better <gasps> yeah. <Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> you're literally like Wait. blowing my mind uh -huh. Kathleen uh huh uh huh wait uh huh uh, what's F Fran Fran Catalina <gasps> oh my god! <laughs> Actually, you know, Ruby comes up with a lot of great designs, and we oh, we, on the back, it was like yeah. we we actually talk uh, a lot. She gives me a lot of awesome uh, design ideas. You know, I, I think like the fish one the best. The mind of a ten-year-old is a lot different than the mind of a of an adult, and sometimes it's genius. So I, I try to. I try to show her all the things I make and see if she likes it. She's sort of my focus group or test audience. Works out, right kid? You ask Vicky a lot, but... I asked the wife too. Actually, the wife has been on fire lately. She comes up with the best ideas. <laughs> this may have been her idea, actually. Come to think of it. The heart in this. I, I love the texture, and I love that. I love your stuff. This has like a steampunk sort of look to it, doesn't it? With the big Steam brass, pump. yeah, like the big brass rod. Yeah, I mean, they remind me of like a beer thing, it's just the beer brass. You put it. What do you know about egg. beer? <laughs> <laughs> no, like right there. What? They store it in like uh, big, big thing of jiggies. Oh, kegs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do me that. Okay. Mm, that's the big keg. That's questionable. Oh, it's like the pourer, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah oh, it's a tap handle. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It looks like a tap handle. It does. To me, it's not even important that it's woodworking. To me, it's important that she understands how difficult it is to make money and how much effort is involved from getting the material, drawing a design, executing that design, finding a, you know, a, well, finishing the piece, meaning like shellac or whatever, making sure it's food safe, advertising it, taking photos, making the photos look good, that people will want it, how to edit digitally, edit photos, posting those photos, how to have an audience who buys it, and then once they buy, you know, handwritten note, wrapping it, shipping it, 
that cycle to me is a lesson in and of itself for children. And I don't even care if it's wood or what, but the fact that she understands what that cycle entails and how much effort's involved, I think she'll have a better appreciation when she spends her money. Essentially, you're a one-man factory. Right? Basically. You, basically. You're, you're basically a one-man CEO and factory built in. It's difficult. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's called. That's why it's called work, right? Uh, yeah, it's work. Yeah, I love it.